All right, so we are in Psalm 120, and we we started Psalm 120 several weeks ago, but we didn't uh, we didn't get very far. We did the first couple of verses, but the psalm itself uh, we gave it the theme of sur- surviving distress because if you read through Psalm 120, and it's not very long; it's only seven verses long. You can pick up on the fact that uh, they are in distress. Now, Psalm 120 is the first song of degrees, which there was. there's a group of songs called the Songs of Degrees, and it begins with this one. And uh, these are the songs that the Jews would sing as they traveled from wherever they lived all over the world to come back to Jerusalem for the required feast. And so uh, we looked at the first two verses where we saw a prayer of distress, and then in verses 3 and 4, tonight we'll pick up there in verses 3 and 4 where we see a promise of destruction, and then verses 5 through 7 where we see the problem of dwelling. And so we'll begin there in Psalm 120, verses 3 and 4, and the Bible says, What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue, sharp arrows of the mighty, with coals of juniper? That doesn't sound like a very pleasant thing, and it's not. Now, I don't think that the wicked uh, think a whole lot about the rewards of their wickedness, because I think that if they did, uh, they might not be so inclined to act so wickedly. It would take an awful lot of rebellion to know that you are facing certain rewards, if you will, for wickedness, and yet continue to do so. But the Bible is very clear there is a reward for wickedness. Um, some verses for your consideration, Deuteronomy 32.14. Deuteronomy 32.41. I'm sorry, 32.41. I'm reading dyslexic tonight. I don't know why. Deuteronomy 32.41, it says, If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. So we often think of a reward as a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. You can get a reward for bad things, too. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, and verse 39. And I am this day weak. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 39. I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruah, be too hard for me. The Lord, get this, shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. So there is a reward according to the wickedness. Those that are a little bit wicked, I guess, get a little bit reward. Those that are very wicked get a very big reward. And then Psalm 31, 23. The psalmist says, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Now, you know that the Christian is not the proud doer. Uh, Pride is a sin. And so, very clearly, it's teaching here that there is a plentiful reward for the wicked. And then the last one is Isaiah chapter 3, verse 11. He says, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with them, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. Now, we probably wouldn't use in normal conversation the word reward toward the wicked because it sounds like something good. But biblically, it's it's like saying you're going to get what you have coming to you. That's the idea. So notice in verse 4, what do the wicked have coming to them? Sharp arrows of the mighty. In other words, a sharp arrow fired by a strong and expert bowman that will hit its mark. Whereas they think that they'll, they thought that they were wounding the psalmist with their tongues but in the end, the Lord would soon wound them. So it is that old and universal principle, we get what we sow, right? If you plant corn, you get corn. If you plant wheat, you get wheat. You get what you sow. And then he mentions the coals of juniper. And I I will admit to you, when I read that, I had to do a little bit of looking and studying and pondering on that because, you know, coals of juniper doesn't really sound all that threatening until you consider certain things about it. But this particular tree is well known for its hardness. It's a very hard wood, and because it's a hard wood, when it becomes a charcoal briquette, it burns hotter and longer than most other woods. So the coals of juniper are coals that burn hot, 
and burn long. So in that sense, God's judgment is not going to be any walk in the park. It's not going to be something simple. It's going to be hotter than they want, and it's going to be longer than they want. That's what God's judgment will be. So just for a moment, let me give you a couple of things about God's judgment that we need to remember. And the first thing is that God's judgment is not revenge. God is not getting revenge on the wicked. It is justice. God always judges righteously, and He always does what is appropriate for the action. Proverbs 26, verse 27 says, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. I think that's interesting. A guy digs a pit, obviously meant for something or someone else, and he's the one that falls into it. And the idea there in Proverbs 26 and 27 is not a literal guy digging a literal pit and falling literally in it, but that he's digging some sort of trap for someone and he falls into the trap himself. It goes on to say, And he that rolleth the stone, it will return upon him. It's like pushing a rock uphill. When you let go, it comes back at you. So the second thing we need to remember is that God's judgment is certain. It's going to happen. You can't avoid it. You can't postpone it. It's going to come whether you're ready for it or not. I like the way in Numbers 32 and verse 23, I like the way Numbers 32, 23 ends because it says, be sure your sin will find you out. So you're not going to get away with it at all. Anything that you do will not just be brushed under the carpet and forgotten about. And sometimes in the world in which we live, we see the wicked and they prosper. And we wonder why. And sometimes we see the righteous suffering. And again, we wonder why. But God is not asleep. God is in control. He's not forgotten anyone. He's not forgotten any detail. He will always do the right thing. You might not see it in this life, but that doesn't mean that God is going to allow sin to go unpunished. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, teaches something about this principle. It says this, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, it says, some men's sins are open beforehand. In other words, you see it beforehand, ahead of time, in this life, if you will, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. So in other words, sometimes you don't see the judgment happening now. Sometimes you see it later. And then verse 25, likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. So sometimes we see the rewards of God upon the wicked and the righteous, but sometimes we don't. But if we don't, rest assured that God is not slack concerning His promises. God's judgment will be reckoned upon them. So, promise of destruction. For you and I, it's a blessed promise because we know that there's coming a time someday when God is going to eradicate evil, eradicate wickedness and sinfulness. So let's move on to verses 5-7 through seven where we see the problem of dwelling in verses 5 through 7. Psalm 120, verses 5 through 7. The psalmist says, Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesic, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. Mark those two spots. We're going to get to that in a minute. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hated peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, I mentioned earlier in our introduction several weeks ago that it's a bit interesting how the psalmist speaks of the problems of his dwelling. And he spoke of dwelling in the tents of Kedar. Now, if you look, look up Kedar, you're going to find that geographically, that's placed on the northwest side of Arabia. All right? Um, and if you've got the map in your mind, think of Arabia down here. And yet he also mentions that he's sojourning in Mesic, which geographically places him in the area of what we would call today the area of Georgia or Armenia, or Azerbaijan, I think that's how it's pronounced, never really been there, but close enough for me. But if you look at the map, if you look at the map, those two places are about a thousand miles apart. So obviously, he did not literally dwell in both of these places. If he did, his commute back and forth would be incredible. So if it's unlikely that he lived in these two locations, maybe he's trying to communicate something else. So what would he have been trying to tell us since he uses these two places? 
And rather than thinking of the physical characteristics of these places, maybe there's some similarity in what these people were like spiritually in these places. So considering this angle, what was it about these two peoples, if you will, that caused the psalmist to use them as an example of where he did not want to be. He was there, but he did not want to be there. Well, one point's obvious. The psalmist wanted to be in Jerusalem, but instead he's far from the city of Jerusalem and the house of God, and no Jew wants to be that far away from Jerusalem. But secondly, he mentions that he's dwelling with those that hate peace. And i got to tell you, that in the world today, that's the way it feels like we're living. Seems like we're living in a time when nobody wants peace and everybody just wants violence and, and, and rioting and bloodshed and that sort of thing. Um, so he mentions these dwelling places. And we learn from Ezekiel 27, 13, and you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. But in Ezekiel 27, 13, uh, we learn that Meshach dwelt or dealt in the, in the slave trade. That's what Meshach did. They weren't a very peaceful people. Uh, Ezekiel 27, 13 says, Javan, Tubal, and Meshik, they were thy merchants. They traded in the persons of men and vessels of brass in the market. So they were slave traders. And as we pointed out in the introduction, Kedar was the second son of Ishmael. And his offspring, Ishmael's offspring, were goat herders who stayed mainly on the northwest side of Arabia. Well, this man, Meshik, becomes the father of the Kedarites, which was a large nomadic Arab tribal confederation. And if you know anything about the Arabs, they have never been friends with Israel, ever. So the psalmist is saying that his, he's living among a people, and it's like being in these two places. It's like being around people like that. He's not comfortable living there. He doesn't like being among the wicked. Now, Christian, that's a lesson we need to remember. Sometimes you have no choice. We go to work, and sometimes we work with people that are lost, and we have to you know, deal with what we have to deal with on a daily basis, and we have no choice. Sometimes we do have a choice. Sometimes we don't want to make the choice because it can be difficult, but we have a choice. And in a case like that, it is very tempting not to want to live among the wicked. We can't just live on a mountaintop somewhere and, you know, avoid the world. On the other hand, we're not very comfortable. If you find yourself comfortable among the wicked, something is spiritually wrong. You need to check up on that. So the point is, he wasn't comfortable living among the wicked. Only the wicked should be comfortable among the wicked. The child of God ought to be a peacemaker. And that's what he said. He said, every time I try to talk about peace, all they want is war. It's difficult to dwell in a world when so much of its activities is evil and not peaceful. So just as the psalmist felt so far away from the Lord's house, dwelling in the tents of Kedar, the believer sometimes feels far away from the Lord when he finds himself living comfortably in the world. And the Bible tells us time and time again, don't be comfortable in the world. Don't love the world. Jesus said in John 15, 19, if you were of the world... The world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. John 17, verses 14 through 16, when Jesus was praying, he said this, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So the world rejects Christ, and as a result, rejects Christ's followers. That's us. And we should not feel it strange if the world doesn't like us. And sometimes we sing the, the, uh, the old hymn, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And we sing that. I wonder if sometimes we actually think about what the implication of that is. Don't lay up your treasures here. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's the way we ought to feel. Now we're here. We're to reach out to the lost. We're not to be isolationists, and that's certainly not what I'm saying. But if you find yourself comfortable in the world, something's wrong. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. 
Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our conversation is. It doesn't mean our speaking. It means our lifestyle, our living, our home. We are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That's what the Bible tells us. Sometimes we wonder how long it's going to be before the Lord finally wraps things up. I don't know. I wish I could tell you. It'd be nice to know. I mean, we just want to move on, you know, to a more contenting existence. Heaven, walking on a street of gold and living in, you know, our mansion and all of that stuff. But we're not. We're here. And if you have somehow become comfortable here, check up on your spiritual growth. Check up on your spiritual life. Your walk is not right. And if you think about it, much of this world's history is told in stories of conquest and defeat. And those who desire to live a peaceable life with all men have always found it a challenge to do so. We are no different today. 2020 has been a challenging year, no doubt. We've had lots of issues, worldwide issues, in 2020. Of course, everybody right now is thinking about the COVID virus. It's an issue that's been a problem this year. But thankfully, thankfully, that's not the end for us. That's not the end. It's just something that we have to put up, put up with for a while. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's a promise you need to bank on every day. John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's his promise to us. Sure, there's problems, but the psalmist, but just as the psalmist did, we also can do the same. Back in Psalm 120, verse 1, and I'm about to wrap this up, but in Psalm 120, verse 1, he says, In my distress, are you distressed? The very next phrase should be very meaningful to you. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Psalm 120 is the first of the Psalms of Ascent. We've already covered some pretty important lessons. Lessons that teach us that we can call upon the Lord when we're in distress. He's listening and he'll deliver. That God's not sitting idly by allowing the wicked to have their way, but someday he will punish sin. We can learn these lessons. We can remember these lessons. That we're not citizens of an earthly kingdom. But we're citizens that we're children of the great and high king of kings. The king of heaven. That's what we are. We're on a journey. So don't put down your stakes here. Don't be like Lot. Don't become comfortable in the world around you. All right. Remember who you are as a child of God. Remember that as a child of God, you have access directly to the throne of your Father anytime you're in distress. And it ought to be anytime, right? Just like the song we sang tonight, sometimes when life is gentle and blessings come my way, I turn my face away from you and soon forget to pray. Let's not be that way. Let that not be our lot. Let's close in prayer and then we'll break up into groups and then we'll go pray for the needs that were mentioned tonight. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Psalm 120. It's a blessing. Every part of your words a blessing and encouragement to us. But as we, Lord, as we look at these psalms devotionally and, and just apply them to our lives, we're encouraged, Lord, for your, for your greatness and, your, for, and for your graciousness toward us. Now, Lord, as we go into our time of prayer, Lord, that our hearts would be prepared, that our prayers would be a sweet-smelling savor before you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed.